Welcome to this week's episode of The Nero Show. In today's episode... BMC have released their new team machine R01. What do we think? Keegan Swenson gets beaten by a 40-year-old, but the US pro gravel scene is legitimised. Let's talk about the gravel world champs. The death of the training wheel. Are we missing out on something by always running race wheels? And who do you call when you have a mechanical to avoid a divorce? All right, let's get into it. New BMC got launched. Mm. The team machine R. Firstly, why the hell do they call it the team machine? Can someone please explain. It is an aero bike. Their aero bikes are the time machines. So now in their all-road climbing bike category, they now dumps this aero climbing all-rounder, and I don't understand it. Because it's more, looking at it, it is more aero bike category than climbing bike. It doesn't even look like an all-rounder. You saw that on a website's page. You're going, that's the aero bike. Well, the question that we don't know the answer to is, is this the death of the time machine? And it doesn't sound like it is. So you potentially are arguing here that they've got plans to create an Uber aero bike. I mean, but that's then on my Cam hope. Nichols' video, he says they've got plans to do an Uber lightweight bike, which would make more sense because I don't know how you can make it more. It's an aero frame. It's got deep sections. Hard to see that go, sitting in a lineup against another more aero bike. So it's semantics because it's just the name. I guess it doesn't really matter, but that was just confusing. I, I don't it's know. Weird. I, I, I don't know. I think you could. I think they could. I do think they could go the full ribble, just absolute massive down tubes, everything. Yeah. I mean, oh, so was this a, so, so from a brand's perspective, so they've sat down in a room and they've said, we don't want this to be an aero bike. That's what they've said. Is this just the SL8 effect coming into action where they want to have a bike that competes with the SL8 as an all-rounder, so they're just calling their aero bike their all-road bike so it's in the same category as the SL8? Like, is that why? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The SL8 effect. The SL8 effect. Yep. Yep. It, it, they've, they've decided that the focus groups are saying – that if you call something an aero bike, it's going to ostracize a larger proportion of the buying public. So let's stay away from that word, but still lean on the aero factors of this bike to, to sell it, which is weird. Yes. Thank you. And remember when they first we started, we saw the, we talked about this, didn't we? I'm sure we did. When we saw Ben O'Connor's bike with that sick, wrap on it at the tour or the Dauphiné, wherever it was, we were calling it the time machine, weren't yeah, we? we did. Yeah, mm. update to their time machine, which is what it is. Mm. It's just they've chosen to go on with the team machine. You said there a focus group set. Well, get him in Okay. There. Get a focus right. group together. Now, can anyone in the comments let us know if you've been part of a focus group for cycling? I would be pretty impressed if a brand was spending money doing focus groups on their products, do you think they have enough money to be doing that? Or it's just a captain's call in the marketing room? I think Trek and Specialized do. Yeah, I do. I do think Spe Spec and Specialized do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Trek and Specialized. But uh, the rest. If that's true, there must be someone watching or listening to this right now that has been in one of these and has been doing the survey for a brand or an anonymous brand. There's got to. There's got to be someone. I'd love to hear what they've what they've done. If it exists, you're out there. That's pretty. I'd be impressed. I think that's cool. If if our industry is big enough, where they're doing yeah, focus group testing. It's like very sounds very sort of uh, political, sort of like <laughs> big money. <laughs> we need the right. <laughs> I wonder how it'd work in the cycling world because I'm sure it's I'm sure it's not like you know come to the local theater and we'll show you pictures of new bikes and go from there. I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's a dealer's, it'll be something through their dealers, the specialized stores where they'll, they'll ask dealers to, maybe we can ask Grant this, to, to potentially survey their top 20 customers for, you know, whether they want a new Venge or a new Roubaix or something. Like, I don't know. I kind of potentially feel like it's something like that. And that's why when we talked about like what specialized next move is, why I think that matters is because they, I reckon they're the only ones doing the, the research into what the market is. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Curious to see. Back to the 
Back to the bike. So are you a fan of this or are you not a fan of this? Okay. I'm a fan. Okay. I'm a BMC fan. I think the, it, the bike looks amazing. And it ticks nearly every box for me. Now, if we get rid of the limited edition version, which is 15,000 euro, and we just go to the, the Jura Ace version, which is the one we can compare to all the other top brands, it's 14,000 euro, which is 23,000 Australian. So it's 3,000 more than an SL8, for example. So when I'm judging a bike and looking through it, I'm always looking at it with the price in mind. So I'm kind of looking for what's, what's wrong with it. Now, there's a lot of things it's doing right, but at that price, it needs to be perfect. And there's one thing it's done wrong, in my opinion, and that's the tire width. The tire clearance. The tire clearance, mm. right? Cam Nichols' video, the BMC guy said it was max 28. Mm. According to the Escape Collective article reviewing it, it's max 30. But we can say somewhere between max 28 and 30, it's one grade lower than most of the 2024 bikes. The SL8's 32 mil um, max width. That's the new standard for a 2024 bike. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at a bike that costs 14,000 euro, I don't think that's good enough mm. to be max 30 because there are people that run 32s. Like that, that's, it's 2024. People want the wide tires and I, I can't see how this got through. And the reason why it stands out is I look at features that you can argue you can argue between the mix of aero and lightweight. You can argue what geometry might be best. But the the claimed tire clearance is just a black and white, more is better. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't, if it didn't have that, I'd pretty much say it's perfect, to be honest. It's doing a lot right, but the tire clearance. From a design perspective, I wonder why you, like, because the forks, Massive. The fork's massive. Like, why? Yeah. What? What is holding you back here? Like, I don't feel like the the Red Bull engineers were sitting around going, "Oh no, we can't, we can't cram another mill of of clearance in there." And it does seem like an absolute no brainer. Just to, it's almost like um, how the on mobile phones now they have the the IP what is IP seven water resistance. It's just like. Box tip to move on next one because there's no arguing it. Mm. It's on there the spec sheet. It's mm. like you can't twist it or spin it. It's just there. I, it must be something to do with the rear triangle. Doesn't fit a 32. It's just a shame. I mean, go into the specs a bit more. It comes with a power meter. Great. It, it comes with narrow handlebars. Thank God. Finally, uh, again, according to Cam's videos, 36, uh, 38s. As standard, I think thirty six. Or was it thirty? I was gonna say thirty six. Let me look up my notes. Actually, yeah. No, I was a. I, I yeah, thirty six in the hoods, and then it flares to the drops. So thirty six as standard. Finally, they get it. You want to ride your bike fast on an aero bike? Get narrow handlebars. So points for that. I'm like loving it. I it looks amazing, but at that price, one thing that's not right, and you you know it needs to be perfect at that price. What do you reckon? Don't disagree. Um, just okay. From the purely bike perspective, I like the look of it. I do like that there seemed to be. Yes, I know people will in the comments say that a lot of this has been done before, but I do appreciate the attempt to kind of differentiate and and maybe this is trying something. I do think that fork design is relatively unique and going against the chat that is circulating circulating the Sydney bubble at the moment. This is a bottom bracket that got bigger and chunkier and what are we calling it? The Mariana bottom bracket? Sounds like a friggin' trench in the ocean somewhere in the Pacific. I I kind of like that. I think that it's a look it certainly looks a little bit different. Um everything else, that top tube kind of little kink in it isn't necessarily for me, um, but it does look different. It looks like a BMC. It does have a BMC look and feel to it, which, which I appreciate. Um, the top tube kink looks mm. like the Bianchi kink. Mm. <clears throat> the Specialisma one. Yes. yes. They mm -hmm. all are kinking. Mm. That the modern day kink. Yes. So that's an interesting feature. Let me look that up actually, Specialisma. Yeah, it's kinky. So I don't know why it's... Um, the way they've done the paint, they love that stuff. It makes it mm. more. It looks kinkier mm. with the 
angle. I don't know why you would accentuate an already odd looking feature. Um, but I do love how they paint the cockpit the same as the into the head tube. It's like, oh, it looks so good. It looks, oh, yep. God, it looks good. Yep, they've nailed that. Absolutely uh, nailed that. All right. Can I can I just quickly talk about this launch? Yeah. All right. So we we do give a little bit of shit about brands for the way they launch their products and, well, ignore who I think they should be using to promote their products and get the name out there. I think they've. I think BMC have nailed this. Okay, from from a lots of different angles, and some of them are cynical, but that's fine. That's promotion. It should be should be about that sort of stuff. So the first one is yes, I yes we've we've gone and got some YouTubers over there. Thank God, well done. I mean, obviously I'm biased in that regard. We've been calling about this for a while, but just go get an old fashioned YouTuber over there. Do a first look at it, nice and easy, and gets gets pushes that. It's a nice soft, what do they call it? Like a soft launch. It's not like a stupid overproduced video that comes out. It's just like here are the bikes, here are the options, and Cam's your perfect guy to do that because he just steps you steps you through the process. Happy days. I like that. Well done. Go get your go get a couple of former pros involved. So they had Cancellara in there. Nice. Has a nice following. Very good. Get a few Girona bubble people in there. Get that sort of stuff all pressed out into their little world. Happy days, very, very good. Beyond who actually did it, I reckon they've also, they're just just leaning enough into the Red Bull thing as well. There's there's no, there's not any, necessarily any detail. They all do this, right? Yeah, who was it that had McLaren? Someone was, someone was. They specialised with McLaren. Was, they they specialised yeah. with McLaren, whatever. But just just sort of soft mention Red Bull because it's the, it's the F1 brand at the Verstappen's moment. face just kind of yeah. pops into the yeah. promo for three seconds. No. Just, Max yeah. had a look yeah. at the shapes and he <laughs> gave it a big tick, you know. <laughs> but just enough of that because they know that Red Bull's got the froth at the moment, you know. We're talking about them every every second week. So throw that in as well. A couple of new little features in there, the big fork. I reckon they nailed it. I haven't seen any of the quote-unquote Elizabeth Loves when I use this term, but the legacy media stuff on it. And I don't think it needed it. I, I actually really rate the way this was launched and I'll be really interested to see how this sort of does from here on in. And it didn't it didn't rely on a pro team thing. And I think maybe that's what forced BMC to do this because they're not going to have a pro team next year. And they're tr- this is the thing, though, because they're trying to sell, <laughs> aren't they? I'm stressed for them. Yeah, they're trying to sell oh, pure performance. With without anyone winning or even competing at an elite level, this is you're going to have to press other buttons, aren't no you? No offense to Tudor Pro Cycling, but I don't see much of them. Now I'm not from Switzerland, obviously, or anywhere in Europe, but I don't know. I don't know. Not in the world to an next year. That's you know, and they're putting a lot of resources into you. They got Cancellara, so they got the ambassador. Then they got the team. The team doesn't get that many eyeballs. It just doesn't. It's just not. I never really see much of them. So that's a tough year for them. That's if you're selling performance, it's a it's a slog, isn't it? Because they're not selling vibe. You know. Oh. No, they're not selling vi- performance. No, no, so not they're vibe, selling performance here. But they're selling froth. Like BMC as a brand still has a Pinarello-esque. Engineering it's, expertise, mm, yes. Yeah, but with that, clinging onto that, you need, I think you do need the images on the front doing their thing. Don't you? I mean, that's a, that's a, lot, of, that's a lot of legacy, like, heritage to, to some. Like, you, if you're still relying on poster of Cadell winning the 2020, what was it, 2012 tour, you know, you're starting to sort of stretch it. I It would be interesting to see it because, yeah, not in the world tour. That's brutal. That's really hard. <laughs> when I say that, I mean as a team that was already in the world tour and had costs of business associated with that and then needing the sales to back that up to then pull out, would be brutal mm. for a brand that wasn't already in there. A Windspace, for example, is a totally different brand. But 
they can obviously make a heap of money without being in that space. So yeah, it's just that already being in there and then getting removed. That's what I mean by not in the welter. It's not to say that brands aren't successful without being in the welter. We've seen that with a heap of brands. It's just the other way around is hard. Well, that was kind of the thing we were talking about the other week with the potential merger. Like that would have been, I reckon, a disaster for Cervelo because that's what they're hanging everything on right now. And the rumours are, I don't know if they're rumours or it's just now fact, but Pon, the owners of Cervelo are the ones who have come in and are stumping up that next 12 months of of funding for the formerly Yumbo Visma, I don't know what they're called now next year, to get them through another year and avoided the merger, which would have put the merged team onto Specialized. Yeah. Yeah. Which would have cost them way more in the long run. Yeah. You'd, well, you would have thought not being in the world to us. So, Yeah. I was just going to say, so BMC selling performance or that kind of thing. I just did want to mention this because uh, I got some <laughs> feedback from owners and people involved in that Standert brand when I was calling them an oh, influencer, the 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 influencer brand. <laughs> yeah. All right. And it was kind of, how do I put this? Like it was sort of neg- like implying that what I said was negative about Standert. Let me say something. All right. So if... If your brand, if your your bike brand is selling vibe and selling aesthetics and selling good looks and you will look, what is that? That is vibe, it's cool. If you're selling a cool factor, that's your go and you get people who what people think are the coolest people, the influencers to ride your bike, that's a good thing. You've succeeded to get the cool people to ride your bike, therefore, by definition, by definition, <laughs> you have succeeded. And so, me saying that it's an influencer's brand, like uh, anyone at Standard is not going to st- sit in front of me and say, "No, no, no, we're actually we we really back our um, R and D wind tunnel testing versus the finest established." Co- no, no one at Standard is going to say that to me. They're going to say, "Hey, look, our stuff looks shit hot." You want one. I'm like, hell yeah, that looks cool. You also want a entirely phased out material. Yeah, no like, one, like no one performance uses alloy anymore. I don't understand why you'd even bother trying to make that point. Just own it. Just own it. Exactly. Because it looks cool. It looks cool. <laughs> Get over it. All right. Your brand is an influencer brand and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, well, if you want to compete in performance, go and show us your frame beating a SL8 in a wind tunnel. Good luck. Well, yeah. I mean, and two things can be true at the same time. Like if I say, if I said that, uh, when I said Factor was an influencer brand, that probably is a bit of a criticism on them. Like if you think about it, because you go onto their website or anything they're trying to push, it's like race proven performance. You know, they're really trying to sell the performance aspect. Like, and for me then to say, oh, yeah, whatever, it's an influencer brand, <laughs> is shitting on it, yeah. okay? Yeah. Whereas, like, when you go – anyway, I've said it. Yeah, so you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. Cool, cool. I'm with you. While we're on bikes and a little bit of YouTube, um, your favourite and my favourite bike reviewer of 2023, Patrick Lino, is back. Yeah. Paddy is on a giant propel. Ooh. He has stepped off uh, some of the Chinese carbons and he's on a propel. The bike the Nero show thought was fast. Thought was fast. That's right. Uh, have a, have you any thoughts on maybe what Patrick's? I have no idea what the video is. I haven't watched it. Patrick's a fan. Patrick's, Patrick yes. likes it. Yeah, no, he's, yep. he's a big fan. Big big fan of the rear triangle, going to Patrick. Okay. Um, but no, in – was kind of interesting watching because he's he's made a bit of a thing out of reviewing a lot of the different Chinese brands, and he he kind of addresses it and he just says basically the shit's all over it. Okay. Yeah, and he, yep. you know, yeah. there's probably a little bit of first ride as we all do. Oh my god, this bike's incredible. That's a that's a problem. Yeah. You could the brain is not very good at distinguishing. It's good at picking up differences. Distinguishing good from bad is quite difficult. I have a feeling if you got any random road cyclist, put them on an objectively worse bike and sent them for a ride, they'd probably tell you it's amazing because it just feels different. You don't really know what's good and bad unless you've tested it up a climb or something like that. So uh, the first ride review is always a bit. First ride impression. 
Impression. Impression. Oh, just an impression. Impression. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're waiting for the, the full well, you'd, review. You'd think, I mean, if, if Giant can't make a propel that's better than a Yolio, it's not, there's something wrong with the universe. So it's not exactly surprising. All right, but I like his sort of, oh, he just gets in, rips in, rides around town and tells us what he thinks. Yep. So, but he's, he's put another call out. He's like, uh, anyone else, let us know any other premium bikes you'd like me to get to review. But clearly, Paddy's got a connection. Yeah, get him. Can get, we get him on a Bianchi? Get him on an Ultra. The Ultra or the spe- Specialisma, yep. please, because there's lacking. Please, someone get in contact with Patrick Lino and send him one of those bikes. We're always talking about fast bikes, but we were at a crit on Sunday. There was a guy in A-grade on Schwalbe Durano Plus <laughs> tyres. They are... <laughs> Honestly, you've got to be top three <laughs> slowest tires in existence. They, they're not even – you've got commuter tires. Then you've got beyond commuter, which is like <laughs> you're never, ever going to take these off and you're never going to flat. Um, so, and the, 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 so the justification was – it was a good old school justification. Oh, you spoke to C- I used to C- do. Yeah, ask him, well, what, yeah. Like, why did you even bother showing up? It's so slow. Um, he said, oh, but I feel really fast when I put my race wheels on. What are we doing? And I said, oh, we're not, you know, we're not good enough for you. Does this not count? Um, but back in the day, you'd run your training wheels. The, the, the day of that's done. The day is gone. The day, I, we've, just, we've talked about a little, little bit of this in the past, but that's, that's a disc brake thing. That's a disc brake thing because there's no, there is no point me ever taking off my race wheels. But do you think you're losing something from doing that? Does this guy have a point? Have we lost something in always having race wheels and yes. race tires? Yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. In, in, yes. I, I don't have. From, from a, you think potentially from a, from a training point of view, now I should probably, as the coach, I should probably have the answer, not you, but from a training point of view or from a, a vibes point of view? Both. Both, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there, it's, there's the vibe, there's nothing like just putting the race wheels on, day of the race. You just, you just gain 10 watts, yeah. 100%, absolutely. And you're more inclined to ride in, not necessarily wet weather and stuff like that, but there's take take more difficult routes, whatever it might be. If you're just on the bog standard bash along wheels, definitely. I, I I do think there's and there's probably also that little thing of, you know, the rides that we do are set routes most of the time. You know, that's it's a three hour this way, it's two hours that way, it's four hours that way. If you are pushing the the Schwabes, you're probably doing a few extra watts on that. At least day. twenty extra. <laughs> At least per <laughs> like, wheel. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> definitely, definitely. I. So what do you run then? So because we, you and I, pretty much train on race setups all the time. Do you have anything up your sleeve that you pull out on race day? We raced last night. Anything up the sleeve to make it feel special, or is the is it gone? It's just I train. With a skin suit now, Jesse. Yeah. That's how far I have come, and it's not that it was not that long ago. Okay. We say this a lot, but 2018 alloy C24s, like, and I wouldn't even take them off for midway races. They'd base it. They'd stay on. They would stay on. Now I'm skin suits for a Wednesday interval session. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh, it's, a, it's yeah. Sad. I'm trying to think of what do I have. I don't really have anything even left for race day. In fact, I'd probably argue for racing now. I I I'm de-optimized because I end up putting cameras on my bike, yeah. <laughs> and as opposed to when I'm training, when I don't do that. Like I even I flirted with putting the 30s on, like for training, or like a Kuna days and stuff like that. But ultimately, I just couldn't be. Don't really be stuffed. Yeah. Just, Sort of, yeah. It's also it. caused because the tyres are so good now. You can run a GP5000 that have bugger all rolling resistance and you hardly flat them anyway. <laughs> so they've made the training setup kind of obsolete, which I don't know where, to, uh, where I don't know where I sit on, but I have the air hub. So for those who don't know what an air hub is, it's I take my front wheel out, I put the air hub, which is a whole front wheel, and the hub has magnets in it which suck watts. So it adds resistance. 
So I'll do that for training. Um, so that kind of works in a similar way to having a really slow training setup. And I appreciate doing that every now and again. Um, it's a but, good flex but, too. Yeah, it is. Very good flex. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Who's this guy think he is? Yeah. Oh, you ride too fast. Um, gloves. I reckon gloves. That's about, that's literally the only race moment thing I will do is put, put gloves on. Actually, quick shout. Has anyone got good durable gloves? That aren't the stupid air. I'm not doing the aero like friggin' Michael Jackson ones that go up to your elbows. <laughs> I just or rubber gloves that go up to your elbows. I want like just a normal glove that's going to last more than three weeks. Like every glove I run just seems to really? demolish. Yeah, Rafa protein mitts destroyed. Didn't, huh? Really? Yeah. Oh, might have been and going they're not, pretty they're just good. Flap about. Yeah, might have been going all right. Um, but I have I have training gloves and racing gloves. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the training gloves get the slobber on them and beautiful. We've had the glove discussion mm. before. They don't get washed often enough. Mm. Um, yeah, gloves, gloves. Just sad. It's just it's kind of sad. You don't have a race. I mean, I even run the same helmet now. The days of putting on an aero helmet are gone. It's yeah. just one one fits all. Yeah. yeah, very disappointing. Right, year two of the Gravel World Championships, yep. and we'll be the first to admit that. The first edition, we couldn't jump on and shit on quick enough. Year two, has that changed? What do you think? Well, my opinion is kind of crap because I've only watched the GCN highlights, which were about five minutes. I don't know if I've gotten the full picture. I looked like a great race. I think it was cool. I'm a fan. From the five minutes I've seen of it, deserved winner. Hmm. Uh, so what have you watched of it? Was there a full, well, this full is, race okay, coverage? So this is half the problem, right? So I obviously Jen's gone over there and we were talking to her about the whole thing. So I knew when the women's race was on and after, so obviously Australia, time difference, blah, blah, blah. So I woke up the next day expecting to see the, the full race, et cetera, of the women's race. Nothing on GCN, couldn't find anything, couldn't really find. Normally then you find the highlights package or something on YouTube, it was as though the race didn't exist. Turns out, look, there's a there's whole shit storm about this, about how the, the promoters didn't actually allow for there to be a live coverage initially and the UCI was surprised by it, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into all those sort of details. Um, turns out there, there were still cameras and stuff going around. So it was filmed and there is a, a really good, 30, 40 minutes highlights package or of the last sort of 50 Ks that exists of the women's race, which I have watched. Um, fast forward to the guys race. There was live coverage, but again, it was really only the last hour and a half. And yeah, it's, it's like dirt bikes following these, these guys in pretty random remote places. And the race is kind of run. It's, it's like fast forwarding to the last 10 Ks of a Tour de France stage. And, and you're like, Oh, okay, these guys are in the break, right? These are the guys fighting it out. So you don't get the whole race mm. playing mm -hmm. out sort mm -hmm. of thing, all right? Which, okay, initially on, this, on the surface, I'm there going, oh, that shit, that, that's on a that crap that we didn't get to see all that. But how many good live, we talk about this a lot, like how many good live or even review videos have you seen in any of the Lifetime Grand Prix stuff? Nothing. Doesn't exist. I haven't exist. really watched anything, no. So, you know, I mean, it's better than that. Um, which it's is just an unfortunate time of the year. I just, even if they had a full race coverage, I just, there's nothing in me that would watch it. I, no, I disagree. I'm, I'm, I'm over. I was pumped. I was pumped. I don't this. know how you yeah. managed to get the momentum no, going again. You're mad. You're mad. I was fully up for this. So I was buying into all the storylines. So I was like, with, like our chat to, to Dylan, I was this, the big thing for me was, was this going to legitimize, legitimize the U S gravel scene? Okay. we got these. Pro, semi-pro guys over there that are all meant to be bossing these amazing events. We've got the old washed-up has-been pros as well. What's going to play out? And I, I was kind of fascinated by it. Unfortunately, there's no – with the coverage, there was no actual way of seeing how that – the only – you know, all you can do is go look at the top ten and go, right, well, Keegan finished, what, fifth or sixth? Yeah. Fifth. Yeah. So – Fucking what a legend. How good's that? Th that's totally ticked the box in terms of the criteria of trying to legitimize the US gravel scene. A fifth at Worlds 
pick, 100%. And if he's out sprinted because he finished with Valverde, they mm-hmm. were together. Mm-hmm. If he had managed to put together a bit more of a sprint, he's then fourth. But, I mean, that's a, about as good as you, you're going to get, really. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I <laughs> you, was, did you want him to win Well, right away solo? Okay. So, yes, you're right. Like, if he's on the podium, this conversation is very different for me. Um, and, again, it's hard to know how, like, everyone else played out. Look, the thing with him is clearly he is a step above everyone else in those lifetime Grand Prix races this year. That's been pretty obvious. So he's he is above everyone. So I was I was kind of – and it, this is meant to be on his – this is his shit, right? This is his jam. And the guys he's competing against – that's not what they do day in, day out. So I thought, I, I mean, maybe it's not as as split as that in terms of a discipline, but I, I did think that he'd be right there fighting for the win. And I think also for me, I mean, that's a lot of pressure on one guy. Uh, the, the, the rest of the, the lifetime Grand Prix athletes didn't really factor either. No, but did you see them roll off the start? Yeah. This, this, the mm-hmm. field was huge, mm. basically going into a glorified cyclocross circuit, it looked like, for an individual with no really any teammates, just to even be in the guys making the top one, two, or three groups in that. That's so, yeah, so difficult against, as well, against guys that are used to fighting for position. That's what roadies do all year. So in terms of positioning, the roadies have a massive advantage over the gravel guys in terms of just the bar-to-bar positioning side of things. Technical side, obviously, different story. But I don't know. I, 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 he blew me away. That was – I didn't even think – I didn't think he'd – not that I didn't think. I didn't really, honestly, analyze it too much beforehand, but – I had no assumption he was going to be in the top five or top ten. I thought he'd float around, you know, mid-pack. Okay, fair enough against World Tour pros. The fact that he got fifth, I, I'm huge, huge result. I don't know. I didn't have a horse in the race as such, but I was still left. Nah, maybe it has. I don't know. It hasn't kind of <laughs> just written it down. And and think the other thing playing in the back of my mind is the women's results. So the women's results. Okay, so um, Lauren Stevens came sixth. She's American, but she's kind of a, a hybrid because she is a a world tour pro, but she does ride a little bit of the the um, Grand Prix stuff. But the the women who dominate the Grand Prix stuff weren't really that relevant in the race either. That was mostly mostly the top end, and I suppose the difference there is the world tour pros in the women's race were the legit full top end. No offense to Mate Mahorich, who's won a monument, but the top three or top four are kind of very, very consistent in the women's pro rank. So I don't know. For me, I'm not I'm not sold either way yet. Do you what do you expect then from a gravel coverage? Like do do we do we expect a, a full road, you know, I want the follow cars, I want the motos in between, I want everything. Like is that is that what it should be at this point? hundred percent. I mean, mm. if you can't see the entire race, what's the point in watching? But because see, this- you want to see when the break, when the action happens in a gravel race, it happens from start mm. to finish. But this is going to come straight back to this argument in the first place that last year's course was so shit, but it was easy to film because it was essentially a bike path and it was kind of, it was easy for there to be coverage. And it was, it was a glorified cycle cross race, which was easy to film. Like, yeah. I think racing first, course first. You need to have a – if you're doing a gravel world, there needs to be a proper gravel – it needs to be gravel, not footpath. Uh, so – and ideally some sort of hills you'd, you'd want to see. Um, so right, course first, how they actually technically film that. <laughs> I mean – So my, my take is we – I agree, but we don't necessarily need live. I think that if we got a really good – a really good two hours of 
brake formation, the whole thing, well packaged, that would that would suffice if there if that meant a really good course. That's that'll be my my take. Is it on filming it. it live? Is it is that a te- logistical or technological well, challenge? Is it? I would imagine, especially if if you start, you know, look at some of the races, especially like in the, the US and stuff that are going into like back ass and nowhere mountains. Yeah, I mean, so you'd th- rather have is, the camera there, even if there's no wireless coverage, and then you upload. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a higher priority. Having a coverage, put a pack, put, upload it the next day. Who cares? We want to. We want to see. Yeah, it would have been good if you actually watched more than five minutes before we talked about this. But anyway. But again, I don't really care about gravel. It's still I. I would even if they had the entire race with amazing coverage, I'm not going to watch it. I. I if it was at the start of the year when I had nothing else really to watch and it was the start of the road season, I'd be interested. Uh, but it is October and I'm already washed up from the season as it is and then it's a really long gravel race. Yeah, probably not going to watch. Like I would stay up to watch the Tour of Flanders or Paris roubaix mm. But then if you put it in around there, you're not going to get any of those guys doing it. I mean, this is – like Mohoric isn't going to race this – in April, you don't. I th- wouldn't. It, it'd be good training, don't you reckon? It'd be good to slip it in in the classic season. Classics, long distance races, short punches, technical ability, similar demands. I reckon it could. You could. You could put it in. Could work. I don't know. I just feel like the risk of the risk of crashing. Maybe maybe it's not as high given the bunches are, are smaller. And okay, yeah. Your chances of coming down are, are higher, but the chances of an injury are potentially less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I like I always feel like the end of year is is that's when your world championships or events are on. Um, I don't know. Can I, but can we just quickly mention Alejandro? Can we He's gotta come back. Surely twenty twenty four someone's gonna sign him. He's gotta get a contract, that boy. If he's getting around, come on. Like if Cav gets a contract, if Cav's getting a contract. He's clearly still angling for one. I reckon. There's the, <laughs> if someone properly came up to him and said, "Alejandro, come on, pin it on one more time," he'd have to agree. Surely, like he's got nothing else to do. He's, some of his DSing this year has been pretty terrible. So I don't know. Get him in there. Get him in. A, get him on back on a bike. Uh, kit's back in stock, by the way. Skin suits are back in stock. If you want to grab one, there's also a black version of the skin suit. People wanted to ride the skin suit but didn't necessarily want to. If they're racing, sometimes you need plain kit or they just prefer plain design. So I did a run of um, pretty much plain black ones. It's the exact same. It's just uh, plain black with a couple of Nero logos. Jerseys are back in stock. And um, thanks to people that bought them, I've asked people to leave reviews. So if you want to get feedback on what they're like, what people think, some sizing things, go on the website, check out the reviews, and you can hear what some people that already bought them think of it. So have a... Have a look. Links down below. Some news in the tech world this week. Um, basically, Apple are now not going to be supporting the original um, Apple Watch. So any new software developments, et cetera, et cetera, won't be pushed out to that original Apple Watch. And there's a phrase in the tech world, I think it's basically planned obsoletism or something like that, that you know, everything has a lifespan and beyond that, Everything has a lifespan that will not be supported anymore by by the brand. We're probably not at that stage yet <laughs> in the cycling world, but it's going to come. We're going to start a conspiracy right well, here. It's got to come, right, because th- there's no way that all the tech that we're using right now will look the same in 10 years, will look the same in 15 years, and there will be certainly components, like elements to this stuff that will be obsolete You'll, you'll have it, it'll be in everyday usage now, and in 10 years it won't be used at all. Any thoughts, any thoughts? ideas where we could be I don't know, here? it's an interesting conspiracy thing to go down because there's just inadvertent obsolescence. Like I have an eight-speed bike and I can struggling to find a chain. I don't wouldn't say that's planned. That's just unfortunate. You've got a really odd product. And even things like I've got a Garmin 500 from 15 years ago I don't know if Garmin are going to keep investing money in updating that. I technically is not in the the evil planned side of obsolescence, probably just in a natural life cycle. Is there anything which I think is 
Well, there's one that came to my mind straight away. The, the first one that I think like is the SRAM battery. So the, the way I see this, well, it, there's got to be a point at some point in the development of that, of that um, component or that group set, sorry, that that battery becomes a design issue for whatever they want to produce, produce going forward. So whether it be they want to re reduce the weight, so they might have to reduce the, the size of the battery, or maybe they reduce the, um, the reliance on two batteries or whatever that might be. So whatever the, the battery is that you have at the moment, which is pretty much, I think, backwards compatible to the original um, SRAM ETAP, will ultimately end up being obsolete. I mean, you kind of see it in little things like the, the, Sh the Shimano 12-speed cable is different charging cable to what the previous one was. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that SRAM battery is, is an obvious one to, to happen. The one that comes to mind for me is the, the chains. So as you get more gears in the back, the chains have to get thinner because it has to fit in the space you've got between the cassette and the frame. So in theory, the chains don't last as long because there's less material there. So there's, there's things like that. But I, I think... The bike industry as a whole, call me not naive, but are pretty sustainably, sustainability conscious. Um, so I, I would actually say with most of I'm thinking just through my setup with my bike, I don't go through that much stuff actually. You've got, I've got, I'm on a wax based lubricant. So the chains last longer, the cassettes last longer with electronic shifting I'm not going through cables. I'm not going through outer cables. I've had my day two group set for it's going on three or four years now. Oh, I think in terms of that sort of obsolescence thing, where the bike industry is pretty pretty good. I mean, the the overarching thing is just um, that. No, actually, yeah, no, no. I think they're I think they are pretty good yeah. actually. I mean, it's it's obviously it is different because like the software enhancements to get pushed out to like a new Apple Watch or whatever, like is like you just said, your DI two is five years old, whatever it is. It does exactly what you wanted to do. There's not really any firmware push that's going to. Oh my God, this has really ramped up my DI two. You're happy with it? Like that's it's going to be kind of different from from that perspective. I I do understand yeah. that. Um, so, but I just, I just think that as we'll get more and more electronic, I mean, even stuff like Ant Plus, like I wonder whether Ant Plus will suddenly like just be sort of phased out because it's a, it is a kind of shitty data protocol that doesn't work very well. Um, whether that just suddenly you're, well, not suddenly, but that, yeah, just doesn't exist in, in years to come. I don't mm. know. I, don't I know. think it's kind of, yeah, I, I think for the, the bike industry now, yeah, now I've thought about it a bit more is, uh, as a whole, pretty good. I mean, it's up to you. you obviously, there's stuff getting released all the time. You can update if you want. But I think they've been pretty good at – I haven't really seen much evidence of, of anything from a planned point of view like you have. Like if you're on an iPhone 10 now, you know, it doesn't work that well. The cameras are clearly not as good. You're really having – like if, if we're comparing to phones, you kind of really have to update – Every three or four years, if, especially if you're if you're in the if you're actually creating content, um, bikes. I'm on a I'm on a seven year old bike and I'm not complaining. I, I wouldn't. I, I'm on a third iPhone 13 Pro. There's no way I'd be on a five year old iPhone I, over my dead body. So that's cool. I rate that. I don't know if this is the reverse of that, but the trend to smaller chain rings. Hmm. Okay. So, how do I? What is my point? Do I want to make here? I'll just I'll just talk and see where it goes. Okay. Um, it wasn't that long ago where it's kind of sh it would have been kind of shameful to ride on anything but a standard chain ring. Yep. Now, okay, the, and that's talking from me. The, I remember being a B and C grader, and. Even then, I was on a standard, and it would have 
wouldn't have even crossed my mind. You're going to have to explain what a standard oh, sorry, is because like, I, I don't uh, think you, the COVID babies are going to know what a oh, standard shit. is. Because right. what are they saying? Like a 48? That's okay. standard. So I'm talking about the front chain ring. Yeah. yeah. And that the front chain ring was a 5339 and at the rear was an 11 to 25 or 11 to 28 maybe. Yep. And that was, when I say standard, like everybody had that who I knew. And if you had a, if you went and got a compact, you were the guy with the compact. I, I remember the first time someone got one and we kind of pointed and laughed <laughs> at it. And we're not like, again, we were not pro, like, pro racist or anything. It was just like, that's, that's what it was. Cause it was perceived as a disadvantage for you. Okay. And like, I look around now. So the reason I bring that up is I see lots of pictures of that Edwin builds a cache of beautiful bikes, does a really beautiful build of a dogma or a whatever it might be. Right. And they're all 50, 50, 32s, maybe a mid compact. So a mid compact would be a 52, 36 yep. maximum. And I can just remember like if, if a beautiful like mint bike like that had gone out with that sort of front chain ring, it would have been like laughed at. And now that's just the way it is. I don't know if I'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably a good I thing. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Because there's so much confusion around chain ring size. I, th I thank SRAM a lot for this because they can't normalize smaller chain rings. They kind of eased us into it with the 10 tooth cog being like, don't worry, your top speed's still the same. And so we all have now kind of gotten used to the smaller chain rings. So I think I got to give them credit for that. Um, it's usually just the Shimano people that are, have a chain ring pride. It's like a st it's just something they wear with pride. It's like I'm on the 54 and I'm fast and it's a thing of pride. And there's also just a lot of people thinking they're going to spin things out. I'm spinning out That's the 5011 not... and I'm – Really? People well, actually think there that. Is, uh, for people that race, there is. Okay. Definitely. For people that race, I hear, as a coach, I hear it semi-often. Like, oh, I'm, I think I'm going to spin out or I'm spinning out. And I don't understand it because a, a 5011 at 110 RPM – is still going 60 plus K an hour. If you're, if you're getting dropped that, you just need to draft better. So I don't, I, I did an entire national series on a 50, 34 compact my first year. So the whole, I'm spinning out my big gear was fake news to begin with. The fact that we now see more smaller chain rings on the average rider is awesome. Totally disagree. Totally disagree. Get them on some big, unusable chain rings. I want to see some grinding going on. I love that image. Like put it, put it all aside. I mean, okay, here's what I actually want to say. The people buying these, spending all this money on these beautiful dogmas, you know, they care about aesthetics. Okay. Riding, meh. Whatever they get around, they're happy with with that kind of thing, and that's not a criticism on these people. People can do whatever the hell they want. This is a this is a style comment, all right. So if you're going to go and spend the money and absolutely trip out your bike, get a big chain ring on there because that's what you you want. You want the picture. I know you. I know you want that picture of the 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 bike at the cafe or whatever it is, or up against a wall. There is nothing better than the big picture of the big chain ring on there. Trust me. You'll, oh, there's at least 70, 80 more likes in there if you, if you push that boundaries. Get no, it on there. It is so annoying to have a big chain ring. Right? When I went from the 5034 to a standard, just riding around is so annoying because you have to go into the small ring more often. Sure. It's so inconvenient. No, no. Run, your, run your 48s. If you have a mechanical, it's a fatal mechanical, right? So, you know, you, you are, you're out of canisters, whatever it might be. Who do you call? An Uber? A hundred percent of the time. hundred percent of the time. Let's remove you from the Sydney metropolitan area. So Uber's not an option. Okay, so the reason... I would never call my wife yeah. if I got a flat mm. or... So, it, just call an Uber. Just suck it up. I, you, you can't. It's so... Let me, let yeah. me explain. Let me explain. I had this exact experience, all right? So uh, out in, uh, in Barrie, sort of Kangaroo Valley... Uh, I had a, 
a mechanical and my dick for crank set came loose. <laughs> Long story. Edwin? Edwin? No, actually not. No, no, actually it wasn't. Okay. Um, descending Berry Mountain. And I was, yeah, anyway, pulled over. I was like, oh, God. Right. So there I'm sort of trying to work it out. And it crossed my, like, I could not get home. Okay? Could not get home. There's, there's no Uber option at this point. And I'm like you because the moment you make that call, right, there's potential for divorce because this, your partner is probably in, certainly in our circumstance is performing the duties that really you have removed yourself from in the first place. So they don't want to not only be informed that they, you require some sort of attention, but also they're just being reminded that you're out there doing the thing that you're enjoying. Anyway, you, you kind of know what I I'm saying. I see what you, you mean. See, yeah, you see yeah, where yeah. I'm going. So that phone call is just you completely want to avoid it. And I don't think there's a circumstance where you really want to make that call because the, the moment she picks the phone up, it's just what? Like there's no, there's no, yeah, anyway. Well, what's your other option? Well, my, <laughs> my, option, mean... my option on that particular <laughs> occasion was literally roll down the hill, roll as far as I could. And walked, walk, sort of skipped into Bray Mountain Cycles. Shout, thank you. And they re-established or reconnected my. Um, luckily, it was open. Re, re put the crank on, and I was able to ride home. And I got home, and I didn't say anything, nothing, yeah. no, because that's the other thing. No, it doesn't want to be any sort of information of what happened. Just move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also have a little short fuse sometimes so if i get a mechanical and i'm in sydney i just want to call the uber get the thing in there don't worry about the money just get home i don't want to stand there honey i've got a mechanical can you come <laughs> she has to pack up she has to get in the car she has to drive all the way out it could be 30 40 minutes before the before she's there and then so it's not just it's so it's an hour plus out of her day i just I just cop it straight away. Um, cost of doing business. <laughs> I will say this did cross my mind uh, when I was thinking about it afterwards because it wasn't relative in that particular circumstance. I would call you. <laughs> I, now, I would call an Uber, but if it was a situation, yeah, I think I would, where, where the Uber wasn't a, a potential option, even if it was just to get to your house or something. Like, yeah, that would be my Come option. Come on, buddy. Let's go. Just, <laughs> up, up. We just don't even – it doesn't need to be said. Just <laughs> what's fuck, it doesn't matter. Get in, right, move on, get <laughs> dump me off. Good. We'll talk about it later. Fine. Um, yeah, that would be it because, yeah, no circumstances where that's particularly going to happen. Another random one for you. Mm -hmm. Hydra packs to a crit, yes or no? Because you know who you are and you were seen <laughs> with a Hydra pack. All right, so here's, here's what I'm thinking. It's the new vibe trend of 2023, 2024. So you know how when it was it was bar bags, yeah. yeah. So you'd turn yeah, yeah, up yeah. to a crit with your bar bag on. Now there was some practical purposes behind that, because especially like we had cameras and stuff. So you'd put, you know, hand the cameras out in the bar bags. So, but you know, let's be honest, it was more of a fashion. It was a fashion. It was thing. a vibe call. It was a vibe decision. Yeah. I think it's moved to the Hydra Pack. So and I noticed that said Hydra Pack rider didn't ride any bottles, just rode out with his hydro. Then after the race, Hydra pack back on, refueling, home. I think it's the new vibe call. It's a look, though, oh, because it's carried over from gravel. I hate to say it, but there is a cool look to the hydration pack. That is, I mean, it looks – I would I would prefer to see someone having a hydration pack than aero socks. It, I think it looks, it looks kind of the cool. The ultimate flex would be yeah. the Hydra pack in the crit. Mm. Oh, so I yeah. would like to see that going forward. But it also looks pro. No one knows what you're doing. It's like, are you off for four hours of extras? Like, no one's really quite sure what the purpose is. So you're also playing that card. Yep. It's, it's a mysterious, oh, yep. is he just come from a, yep. from a four-hour loop or something? You never really know. Actually, that reminds me. Sorry just to go back to this again, but I saw one standard last night. This is a uh, criterium race in, in Sydney. It happens on a Tuesday night. So one standard. Wasn't racing, 
the guy was arriving to watch the race beforehand. He had the T-shirt on. He had the cargo bibs. He had kind of like um, uh, the laced shoes. Pure vibe. Looked super cool, right? Wasn't going to race. That's cool. Absolute influenced, turned up, looking cool. That's where that bike should be. All right? That's Not it. in the race. Not in the race. On the side of it. On the sideline. <laughs> okay. Looking great. Yeah. I do see this a little bit in the comments where people say something like, oh, there were so many ads in this week's episode, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, there were six sets of ads, et cetera. So we don't have – so as it stands right now in October, we don't have any say as to how many ads get put into this or where those ads appear, right? Um now, and the other thing I will say about all that is, so that's how at the moment really this show is sort of generates any revenue is just through the AdSense stuff through YouTube. Um, the podcast stuff, so there n- hasn't been any show partners, I suppose, or we haven't done any ad reads or anything like that. Now, in November, YouTube's going to change that and allow you to select where the ads go. So theoretically we could like, stop talking about a topic and then that's where the ad break goes in, et cetera. So that's kind of useful. And you can also, from what I understand, choose how many ads go in. So that kind of, again, affects the revenue side of it. So what I'm potentially tempted to play with in November and December is how many ads go down and one option of reducing the ads on YouTube for a period um, and doing one or two of those ad read things to, to bring in revenue. Because Ultimately, if we drop the if we drop the number of ads on a YouTube video, it's going to bring less revenue from that perspective. And if the ads annoy you that much, just get YouTube Premium. Mm. Most of if you're watching this show on YouTube right now, you probably watch a lot of cycling or a lot of YouTube in general. And it, it's just get YouTube Premium. It's so nice not having to watch the ads. It's not that expensive. It's def- as someone who recently got YouTube Premium, it's, it's so worth it. Yeah, big time. Um, and it, it, like from our perspective, like when you watch it on YouTube, it's more valuable than, than a podcast player. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's just a fact. So, you know, liking and subscribing and all that stuff's great, but actually just watching it on YouTube is, is very much the, the, the way to go. Yeah. If you can, that'd be good. Uh, but I'm keen to play with that ads thing because I, I do know that frustration of like you're talking and then an ad just pops in the middle of that word there. And then you're coming out the other side. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like that would make the show more pro as well. That Like I could even say something like, okay, and when we come back after the break. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Confirmed. Uh, the audio has worked thus far. Yeah. All uh, how show. do we sound this episode? We sound, we sound pretty look? good, hey? Video's there. Nice. Very good. I'm going to end this before it itself. Probably have to cut out that S word <laughs> due to um, a new strikes. Anyway. Talk to you soon. Yeah.